for the stay at home weekender, West Coast Ramble is here with rock and roll star Eddie Angel. Hosted by Big Sandy, Hope Paul, and me, Tom. Here's Big Sandy. And now on this very special edition of West Coast Ramble, I'd like to bring on a world famous guitar player that I'm proud to call a friend of mine. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Eddie Angel. Welcome to the show. Hey, Robert. Glad to be here. Well, Eddie, as, as part of this thing, as you know, the, um, they took the time to, to ask uh, some other musicians and well known people on the scene uh, questions that they wanted to hear the answers from you from. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so if you don't mind, we'll get we'll get right into that. Um, yeah. uh, um You know, there's a DJ there, uh, uh, Felix uh, Schutze, uh, yeah. Lucky Shooter from Witchcraft, Witchcraft, Witchcraft Records. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th- th- yeah he, there's a there's a couple things he wants to know here. Like, uh, uh, he asks, uh, for many Euro- Europeans, the Stray Cats were the first contact with American rockabilly revival. But even before them, there were some remarkable bands in the USA that defined. The sound, like the Blasters and uh, uh, Tex R- Rabinowitz, and, and, and Felix t- is saying that you told him a great story about te- Tex that you want to might, might want to share with the with the audience here. Oh, I don't know about any great stories, but uh, well, te- Tex Rabinowitz, uh, we were playing. I was in his band in Washington D.C. in uh, 1980, and uh, it was a great scene in in. Uh, in DC, it was, it was a pretty. I mean, every night of the week, you, you could go out and catch a band, uh, all kinds of music. There was jazz, there was bluegrass, uh, you know, and rockabilly. There was Texas Bruno, there was Billy Hancock, and uh, Danny Gatton, who's one of the best guitar players I've ever seen. But um, um, anyway, uh, so and the Rock Cats would, would come down from New okay. York. Yeah. And. And uh, Buzz and the Flyers would come down from New York, and we would share a, a, a bill with them. And then when we, we would go up to New York and do the same up there, and so it was, it was, it was kind of a really cool camaraderie. And when they came to D.C., they, they would stay at Texas House, you know, and um, his and his house was quite a trip, man, because his dad was like this uh, a Brooklyn Jewish lawyer in the army, and his mom was like a Southern Baptist. So it was like you get all kinds of cross-cultural things going on there. <laughs> Everybody enjoys staying there. But, and, um, and A. Bones would come down, Billy Miller and his band. And so and uh, it was great. I mean, and uh, I'll talk about it more later. But um, so that was a scene. I didn't know what, anything else what was going on around the world. I didn't know about the English rock bill scene. But one day, so this is 1980. And uh, I remember one day being in a club and hearing the the Stray Cats for the first time, and thinking to myself, whoa, oh, th- those guys, they put all the pieces together, you know? Because the Rock Cats had the look, you know, they had the, the total look in the show, and and Buzz and the Flyers had the stand-up drummer, rock roll, and and the, and the cool clothes. But um, but, the, but the Stray Cats were kind of new when, when they came along. Kind of, I guess the analogy would be like when Elvis came along, he just put all the pieces together. But... Um, I, I, and so I do remember that. I remember them coming along. But I didn't realize I was so close to the epicenter of what was happening, you know. I thought the straight guys came from out of left in space. You know how it is when you're <laughs> on the radio. You said, where did that come from, you know. But little I know, they were pretty closely connected, you know, because the Dibs from the Rockets later told me that, you know, he he met this, he knew this, he knew uh, Brian Setzer in New York when and, and brought him from, for his first tattoo and first haircut, you know, and his first wow. uh, whiff, you know, I mean, uh, Smarty did that, you know, Smarty gave him his, and so, so it was all kind of cl- closer than I thought, you know, did, but uh, anyway, I don't know what Phil's story was, but. Yeah, got, yeah, no, well, I'm not, I'm, well, that's a, we'll take it. That's a great story right there. And now, Eddie, I got a question. Uh, Don Diego uh, Garassi, he wanted to know uh, something about your recording sessions with Ronnie Dawson, especially the sessions in London at the tow rag. Yeah, well, Ronnie, I mean, I met Ronnie because uh, the Planet Rockers were on uh, uh, an English label called No Hit Records, and, and, and Big Robert Big Sandy was on that label too, and Dave and Deke were on it, and, uh, the Kaiser. So, so a guy named Barney Kumis ran that label. Barney Kumis was really responsible for finding uh, Ronnie in Dallas. You know, he, he, Ronnie had been, maybe Robert knows more than I do, but he was. I think Ronnie was doing voiceovers and commercials and stuff, but but 
But Barney Kumis, you know, being part of that English rockabilly scene, these guys were hip to to, 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 to Ronnie's records. So anyway, they, he Barney found Ronnie, brought him the, to England, and that's how I that's how we met because the Planet Rockers were on that label, no hit records. So fast forward a few years, and um, uh, our very first trip to London, by the way, the Planet Rockers uh, was to do a, 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 a was a gig with with Ronnie and Matt Curtis at the town and country in London and and uh, I remember it's just we were uh, we were kind of nervous but we, we thought these guys are going to love us man they're going to love us in London <laughs> we got to stay so like you know like, yeah, <laughs> but they wound up lo- loving us later <laughs> after they heard our records but or to, you know, yeah they, they weren't going to give it up but anyway um, so Ronnie and then a few years later like 94, 95 I think is when I was in the studio with Ronnie and the studio was was Torak Studio, which in London, which run by Liam Watson, and Liam Watson was as a genius, is all I can say. And and, and showing up at Torak was would be equivalent to showing up at Sun Studios or Chess Records, where you, you're in the hands of a guy who, who who's really going to make a good record, you know. And so that was a big part of it, Torak. And uh, of course, Ronnie was great already. I mean, Ronnie's was. And Ronnie, to record with Ronnie, he was just, he was very loose, you know, and you can, he let you have a lot of freedom, you know, and just do your thing. Um, and, uh, but he, I remember he was always, his only thing was like, at the end of the song, you say, let it ring, let it ring. I don't know why that's his thing. But anyway. But I Ronnie, remember that too. And it flowed <laughs> off into the air. Like. <laughs> okay, Ronnie, let it ring. But, but I got to, but also, uh, anyway, I, I'll get around that too. But, but, uh. A toe rag was in this completely dilapidated, funky warehouse in Shoreditch, East London, which when nobody went there then. It was like, like now it's all fancy, fun, fancy, but back then the cab drivers wouldn't even want to take you there, you know. But it was really funky. But it, Liam got a great sound. He had all these little funky, broken down amps, and you wouldn't think anything good would get recorded there. But, 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 but Liam was a genius. But my it's all a blur the recording uh i mean, i think I'm, I'm pretty sure jarko played second guitar jaco gene who's living in, you guys might know him i know i know big sandy does but he played some great solos man he was a great guitar player jarko and but but i also got to you know the thing is i got to tour with ronnie and that was that was really really a learning lesson touring with ronnie man because he's uh, the consummate entertainer he always gives a hundred percent Oh, every night to every audience doesn't matter. It, and he's, you know, and um, you know, and he's fun. I remember like when we'd be traveling in the van, you stop for gas, and Ronnie would start jogging around the van. He's, uh, you know, trying to take care of himself and stuff. But he was always trying to take care of himself. But anyway, it was. I learned a lot from Ronnie, man. I'm, I'm really grateful that that I got that experience, and I got to talk to him. We talked few months before he died you know and and uh we we told each other that we loved each other and and uh and he, and he told me hey you can you can do it man you, you know you can go out there and do a solo thing if you want you know <laughs> so i keep that in mind sometimes when i'm when i'm doing my eddie angel guitar party i think hey ronnie ronnie thought i could do it so <laughs> hey. I, I too hear a lot of his words of advice. Uh, at certain moments, uh, situations you find yourself out uh, uh, yeah. um, in, in on the road, I remember little things that Ronnie would say. So I I can understand uh, that. Yeah. yeah, part of I'm part of his you know history. You know, I mean, here's a guy who's a real a real rock and roller man. I mean, who was part of the part of the original rock and roll. You know, and makes great records. I'm really glad I got to be part of it. 